Hi, and welcome to the Mayor's Report. I'm Northampton Mayor David Narkowitz, and this is my monthly program on Northampton Community Television, where we talk about the issues and projects that we're working on here in the city of Northampton. This month, I thought it would be appropriate to give folks an update about the stormwater and flood control utility uh, that the city council and the mayor approved and created back in March of 2014. Uh, many people, including myself, uh, may have recently received their utility bills, uh, and it included the first uh, utility billing for the new uh, stormwater utility. Uh, today we're joined by uh, the city engineer, Jim Lorla, as well as our new stormwater manager, uh, Doug McDonald. Um, and I invited them on the mayor's report this month so that we could talk a little bit about the new utility and help people like myself understand exactly how this bill works, what goes in, what's behind it, um, and, and hopefully allow people to understand why this important utility um, is necessary and how it will be really used to help uh, fund our infrastructure now and going into the future. So why don't we start quickly, um, uh, just qu quick primer about what is stormwater? What do we, what do we, th when we talk about stormwater, uh, what are we talking about, Doug? Well, it's, it's uh, surface runoff from precipitation, that from rainfall, from snow melt, mm -hmm. Um, that flows across the land. So yeah. when we have a storm so, like we had last night, for example, where uh, you know a lot of rainfall in a, in a lot of uh, in a lot of in a short amount of time, right. all that sometimes street flooding that people see, uh, uh, you know, deep puddles, uh, backyards flooding, etc. That's what we're talking that's about. That's what in terms we're talking about. Yeah, that's stormwater. And then the question becomes, and Jim, you can jump in, is. What's the infrastructure that we have in place to deal with uh, to deal with our stormwater as well as flood control as well? Sure. Well, the city has an extensive system of uh, stormwater systems within the, the city streets. We have about 5,000 catch basins in the streets, about 114 miles of storm drains, um, over 300 outfalls to rivers from the rainfall that we catch and the stormwater that we catch. So we have a, an extensive system. A lot of the system goes back to the turn of the century, so we have some very old pipes, a lot of systems that are in very poor condition and require upgrade. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, part of the purpose of the utilities to work on improving infrastructure, similar to the North Street project that we did about a year ago. We have a project under design for Hinckley St Street that will improve some of the stormwater facilities there. Um, a, big, uh, a big part of the new stormwater and flood control utility is the flood control systems that protect the city from flooding. Mm -hmm. Um, significant flooding events from the Connecticut River occurred in 1936 and 38. In 1940, the Army Corps of Engineers built an extensive flood control system to protect the city from, from flooding from the river. Mm -hmm. um, because the system was built in 1940, obviously very old now at this point, and the city is under a directive from the Army Corps of Engineers to do evaluations and updates and improvements to those systems, mm -hmm. and they include levees on both the Mill River in the Connecticut River and a very large pump station off of Hockenham Road. So, mm -hmm. very extensive type of system that's very old that we're in the process of, in the process of evaluating. Mm -hmm. And the money that's collected by the utility, the new utility, allows us to do these things for the city. And in addition to things like the, um, like the directives that we're receiving from the Army Corps of Engineers, there's also a, an, an increased environmental regulatory uh, emphasis on stormwater as well, correct Doug? Right, we have, a, we have a permit from EPA for our whole system, so every time the water goes from our system to a river, to a wetland, um, we're responsible for the water quality. Mm -hmm. So any pollutants that get into our system, EPA is asking us to try to tr get those pollutants out, keep them from getting into the storm. And water. they also want us to do, for example, uh, be uh, step up activities like cleaning catch basins and, right. and inspecting right. what what's actually getting into so those into, are, uh, that's all into catch basins. Part of catch basins are a, a pretty simple way of catching some pollutants. There's much more complicated ways. Mm -hmm. There's detention basins. There's rain gardens, there's infiltration systems, there's a whole range of, mm -hmm. of systems that can clean up the stormwater, reduce the flow, and, and, and meet the, the EPA requirements, which there's a new draft permit out um, that's going to soon increase those requirements that we need to do. So um, in looking at these, all these infrastructure needs that we're going to have over the next 10 to 20 years, 
and creating this stormwater utility. Let's talk a little bit about uh, how the utility itself is actually comprised. I mean, when, when people get a water bill, it's because their water meter tells us how much water they're consuming. And the same thing with, you know, inverse, you know, the sewer is based on, you know, water consumption and how much uh, is going into the sewer system. Um, with stormwater, we're talking about uh, impervious surface, correct? How much, how much of that rain water that's hitting people's property is not being allowed to just discharge right into the ground, but it's being somehow deflected or put into the streets or whatever. Is that what we're talking about with right. impervious surface? Right, exactly. So that's a, that's, um, a way to, to look at, an ink, you know, when you, when you take undeveloped land, forest land, and you cut down the trees, and you build a house, you pave a driveway, you compact the soil, less water is getting in the ground, significantly less. More is running off. Mm -hmm. And then um, we so, have to, our so system we need, has we to need a it. system then to deal with that or we'll have flooding. Exactly. Yeah. So the important part of the ordinance uh, as it was approved was really to determine, without a water meter, how do you determine how much you're going to, you'll, you'll bill a customer under the new utility. Mm -hmm. So the, the ordinance goes into some detail about how that's done and we'll talk within the bills in a couple of minutes about um, the term hydraulic area or hydraulic acreage, which is mm -hmm. defined in the ordinance, mm -hmm. is an adjusted factor of impervious area, which Doug was just explaining, impervious area, which is green space on a property, whether it's lawn or forest or landscaping. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of those two factors that's combined and adjusted and then results uh, in the usage number that you saw on your bill when you opened up your bill recently. Mm -hmm. So. Um, part of the way you're calculating this, and we should just dig right into it, um, you're, in, in some ways you're, you're looking at everyone's property sort of from an overhead satellite perspective and trying to identify what is all the impervious surface on that and then attempting to do a calculation, uh, doing a calculation based on the total amount of land uh, versus how much of it's impervious. Right. So there are, there are two different approaches that were used in accordance with the ordinance. One is for residential properties. Mm -hmm. The ordinance stipulates that all residential properties, one to three family homes, mm -hmm. should be placed within a tier system. So there'll be uh, four tiers um, with 25% of residential properties placed in each tier. The tiers are calculated based on um, averages of impervious area, impervious area within a tier and the billing unit or usage or hydraulic acreage, if you will, is uh, standardized and averaged for the tier. Okay. So you're, we'll talk about your bill in a minute where you're in tier three uh, and 25% of the homes within the city are, are also in tier three. Mm -hmm. So we look at um, using aerial photography to help us evaluate all residential properties within, mm -hmm. the, within the city mm -hmm. to place them in the tiers. So the first thing that we did is we, we worked with a consultant that evaluated uh, a figure like this, which shows sort of a purple area showing homes and driveways, which represents the impervious area on a residential property. So we're looking at just a neighborhood shot uh, of a neighborhood, and you can see in purple all of the rooftops and driveways and, and any other garages, things like that, anything that's non impervious. Right, exactly. So th this type of analysis of the purple impervious areas allowed us to develop a tier system which which uh, we turn into a residential billing table mm -hmm. which you'll see here that references the different uh, the four different tiers and what the average impervious area is and what the average impervious area is and then resulting what the what the usage or hydraulic area mm -hmm. um, which is the basis for billing is so the okay. table is important for people to understand because it represents groups of averages of homes mm -hmm. that are built in accordance with the amount of impervious area. And obviously the tier one, it, it goes up and so tier one would be the smallest uh, properties and the, and the least amount of impervious surface right. and then it would go up and up and up and up to uh, right. tier four being the, the largest, uh, the largest areas. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the council, the city council and others within the community felt that doing a tiered system was a fair and equitable way of breaking up uh, mm -hmm. the fees amongst residential customers by having the smallest homes with the smallest driveways with essentially the smallest impact paying the smallest bill mm -hmm. and that's reflected in the billing mm -hmm. table. Okay. All right. So uh, so let's let's talk about my bill. Let's take a look at uh, the bill I just received and um, 
And so we have a, an aerial shot of my house True. that you took, um, which shows I have you know a house and I have a driveway and a walkway and I see a pet the patio and there's even a swimming pool there in the back. So uh, you take a look at my lot, which I think is a 60 by 120 foot, um, you know, fairly middle to average size little lot in the URB neighborhood. Sure. And then you're going to look at that and analyze the impervious. So, so how did that? How does that analysis happen? Right. So for your for your property, when you look at the uh, the aerial photography that you just had mentioned, um, we we look at this analysis. Uh, similarly for every residential property. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we had identified in your property 3,156 square feet of impervious area. Mm -hmm. We go back into that billing table that I described a minute ago and determined that um, your 3,156 square feet of impervious area is in tier 3 mm -hmm. where the range of impervious areas is 3,056 square feet to 4,276 square feet. So you, okay. you fit nicely within tier three, your property does. The hydraulic area from the billing table for tier three properties is 4,990 square feet. And the resulting annual fee based on the billing table calculation is $125.62 for tier three properties. So everybody in tier three is is gonna have an annual fee of 125.62. That's correct. Um, which is uh, going forward would be billed in four quarterly payments. But for this first bill, like the one I received, it actually represents two quarters. Exactly. Um, because of the timing of when the, when the legislation was passed and the time it took to implement it, we weren't able to get it included in the first quarterly water bill, so they're combined in the second quarterly water bill. Yes. Um, so yeah. when you show my bill, I think you have it even up on the screen here. Sure. Um, you're showing me that stormwater factor of 4,990, which was what you just described, um, and then the $62.77 that I've that I've paid uh, represents uh, half of my annual uh, half of my annual bill. Right. For two quarters. So the next bill that you will see from the city for the stormwater fee will be $31 and change. Mm -hmm. So half of what you yeah. paid this time. Exactly, and then going forward, it'll be a thirty-one dollar bill. Um, you know, using at least using this table, that could obviously change in the future. Okay, sure. excellent. So, other uh, talk about a, an example of a maybe a, a different sort of a prop type of property that we have in the city. Sure. So we brought along a sample bill today from uh, from an undeveloped lot, um, which is a good example of of two things within the ordinance. One. Is it's a property that's it's an undeveloped property mm -hmm. greater than an acre. Mm -hmm. The stormwater ordinance uh, caps pervious area at one acre for determining the bill. So when you look at this bill for an undeveloped property, the usage is four thousand three hundred and fifty six square feet, mm -hmm. which is an acre times the point one factor in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. So the usage there is forty forty three fifty six as I've just mentioned. There's a stormwater factor that's shown in this bill of zero point five. Mm -hmm. This is reflective of a credit that this property owner received for having the land in permanent protection. Uh, this particular piece of property is protected under an agricultural uh, okay. protection restriction. So their bill, their usage is reduced in half by the stormwater factor. Mm -hmm. And then using the rate, their bill ends up being $27.40 for the first two quarters. Now, it's important to note that this type of credit for uh, undeveloped land that's protected is automatically applied uh, to the bill for this landowner. They mm -hmm. need to apply for it. Mm -hmm. We uh, looked at city records to determine which uh, properties are permanently protected, and then we applied the credits automatically. Mm -hmm. But we do have a credit program uh, that is in place for, for other, uh, other property owners as well. Um, maybe we should just take a second to just talk about that before we move on to some commercial properties. So yeah. the credit program basically um, allows a property owner to be able to identify some action that they've taken um, to reduce their uh, to reduce their impervious surface that allows them to get some kind of a credit um, toward this stormwater utility. Right. Yeah. So there's a number of other very important credits, as you mentioned, Mayor, um, regarding these bills and ways that people can look at reducing their bills. Mm -hmm. Some of them are automatically applied. There's a senior needs-based discount exactly. and a low-income credit discount. Mm -hmm. 
um, that is automatically applied to the bill. So people that are generally eligible for those types yeah. of tax credits are also eligible for credit under the and bill. And they have to they have to apply for those through the assessor's office as part of the right. annual tax property tax process. So right. what this legislation says is if you qualify for that, you automatically qualify for the same type of a, an abatement on your utility bill. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. So people want to explore those uh, their eligibility for those mm -hmm. types of mm -hmm. programs. And as you men mentioned, there are other types of um, credits that are related to how stormwater is managed on a property. Mm -hmm. uh, there are best management practice types of credits for property that have um, different types of stormwater systems like a detention basin mm -hmm. or an infiltration system. Those sorts of systems would allow um, mitigation for the impacts of stormwater, both mm -hmm. quality and quantity um, on, on city property. So we, all fit, we, all, we, we hear the term rain garden. What, what's a rain garden, Doug? How does that uh, function? What is that? Rain garden is a pretty simple structure. It's just a, it's, it's a basin mm -hmm. that's dug out of the earth, and plants are put in that that can both get very wet, so the water maybe from a roof goes into this basin. Mm -hmm. The plants take up that water, the water goes into the ground, mm -hmm. um, and the plants are plants that can get very wet and then be dry for a mm -hmm. while too. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it takes a little bit of thought, but mm -hmm. it's um, a really simple way that a homeowner could mm -hmm. could reduce the, the stormwater running off of their property. And Jim, is that an eligible sort of a, a, a improvement that a homeowner could make to, for credit toward their bill? It is, it okay. sure is. And uh, there's another important small residential credit as well for things like porous pavement or pavers for your driveway at mm -hmm. your home. Mm -hmm. Something that I'll be looking at for my, for my property as a way of uh, reducing my bill mm -hmm. and improving the way that I manage stormwater on my own property. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are two important Rain ways. barrels, we also are trying to encourage people to utilize rain barrels, which we've, the DPW has been pr providing at a very low cost for, for, for many, many years. How, do the, how does the rain barrels work into this program? So, so at this point, we're, it's in, we're providing even more incentive. It's not a credit, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, we've been selling them at cost, now we're selling them to city residents at $10 less than that cost. Excellent, okay. So it's a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we're, we're trying to get more and more Okay. Rain barrels out there and in, in use. And there's a credit policy online that people can take a look at um, right. on, on the city's stormwater page so they mm -hmm. can go through and read that credit policy and, and maybe look at the ways that maybe they can uh, make these kinds of improvements to qualify for credits. Right. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we move on now because, you know, we've talked about, you know, residential open space. Obviously, some of our biggest areas of impervious surface that people think about are, you know, industrial properties or, you know, large shopping plazas or car lots. So I know you've pulled up uh, Coca-Cola, right. which is one of our largest industrial uh, property owners. Obviously, they have a major property uh, in the industrial park. So what are we looking at here? This is the overhead shot of, uh, of Coca-Cola and their impervious surface. Sure, but Coca-Cola's facility off of uh, Industrial Drive in the industrial park is a very good example of how we look at uh, calculating a specific commercial bill. And this, this is a good example of properties on King Street or how we would also calculate site-specific site bills for commercial properties. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, you're looking at uh, an aerial of Coca-Cola's property and their impervious area for their uh, bottling facility, truck access, paving, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Is about 747,000 square feet is the impervious wow. area. Mm -hmm. So we use that as a as a basis for determining what their usage is on their bill. The balance of their property is about 201,000 square feet of pervious area. So open green space on mm -hmm. their lot mm -hmm. um, is capped at one acre in terms of uh, calculating the hydraulic area, and that's shown in this calculation. Mm -hmm. The final uh, addition for the hydraulic area for the Coca-Cola facility is 714,029 square feet. So when you look at their bill for the usage, the number 714,000 um, is shown, and we do have a we do have a copy of their bill. That you yeah, can there see. it is, Coca-Cola Company. Right. Yeah. So this is a, a good example of of what a commercial customer would be seeing. So mm -hmm. we thought it would be important to show people what this looks like. So you can see their usage is 714,029 square feet, as I had mentioned. At this point, their stormwater factor is one because they haven't applied or received any credit to mm -hmm. their bill. Mm -hmm. And based on the current billing rate for the first two quarters, their bill was $8,982 for two quarters. Okay. So a, a, a fine example, I think, of how we go about calculating commercial bills. 
I mean, the other piece to remember is unlike a, unlike property taxes, um, the utility this utility based on the legislation applies to all property owners. So, for example, nonprofits are not exempt. So, um, so Smith College or Cooley Dickinson Hospital, who don't traditionally they don't pay property taxes because they're tax exempt, um, they will have to pay. Uh, the stormwater utility, correct? So right. talk a little bit about the nonprofits and how that works. Sure, well, it's it's important, I think, that um, these types of facilities, you mentioned Cooley Dickinson Hospital is a very large facility with a lot of parking and a lot of buildings, and they have an impact in the city stormwater system. Mm -hmm. So I think it was felt that it was fair and equitable that they mm -hmm. also contribute to maintenance of stormwater systems within the city. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the decision, I think, that uh, the council had made in terms of everyone contributing both to uh, you know the stormwater systems within the city, but also flood control as a community good, mm -hmm. um, and that was how these uh, decisions were made about sending nonprofits bills. Mm -hmm. I mean, the key thing here too is that you know this is funding that you know, these are projects that we've had to that we need to do. We we need to do them sometimes because of regulations, but also because of uh, aging infrastructure and you know trying to deal with. You know, in some cases, more development, a higher rainfall, you know, more more powerful storms that we experience, and so um, we've sort of limped along trying to do this out of the general fund, like trying to pay for these types of investments out of the general fund. Um, so this provides us now a dedicated source for FY. Uh, 2015, uh, the, the it's, it will generate up to $2 million. Talk about what are some of the projects that you have slated uh, for this um, infusion of new, uh, of new stormwater enterprise funds. What are the types of projects that the DPW will actually be putting this money to work so that people understand uh, how it's being used? Sure. Well, some of the money is going toward very important capital projects. We're working on uh, drainage improvements in the Hinckley Street area. Mm -hmm. That's a project that's under design in the engineering division right now that will mm -hmm. be, be put out to bid this fiscal year. So it's a, in some ways it's a road project, but one of the hidden costs of many of our road projects is, we, you know, if you're going to dig up the road, you've got a storm drainage system that also needs to be repaired, which adds a whole other... It's one of the most expensive kinds of infrastructure, so it adds a whole other multiplier. So now having that stormwater enterprise fund, we can now do the kinds of work on a stormwater project in conjunction with a paving project that we're doing at the same time. Right, and the Hinckley Street project is an important one because there have been drainage problems in that part of town in the mm -hmm. past, and this mm -hmm. will allow us to make some of those things better. We're also working on important flood control projects. Mm -hmm. We're looking at an update uh, evaluation and assessment of the Hawken Road flood control pump station. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that the Corps has asked us or demanded that we take a look at in terms of updating that facility. Mm -hmm. And also uh, doing an evaluation of the city's levy systems. Okay. So getting an, an engineer on board to do certification that those levy systems that were built in 1940 still meet today's standards and are still adequate to protect the city. Mm -hmm. So these are important projects that we had no other source of funding to do until the utility uh, passed and provided that funding. Excellent. Okay, well I, I, I appreciate uh, you both taking the time to, to talk about this and, uh, and I hope it, it helps people at home who you know, may have gotten their first utility bill for stormwater and in some cases it may be their first utility bill because folks who may not be on city water or be on city sewer, people who own a condominium and don't usually receive a bill like this may be receiving the very first utility bill from the city. So I think right. it's important for people to understand uh, what it is, what it means, and, and how these funds will be used to invest in our infrastructure for stormwater as well as for flood control. Um, if people have more questions about it, I know uh, the DPW has set up a stormwater and flood control page on its website. I know we have it highlighted on our homepage of the website, so people can go there. And I know you've got lots of FAQs and videos and all kinds of information that's available. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, we have a lot of information up there, as you mentioned, and we try to keep that up to date with information mm -hmm. for people okay. so they can see. We had uh, posted copies of draft bills, um, the frequently asked questions mm -hmm. uh, document that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. We have information about 
impervious area definitions. Um, mm -hmm. And you also sent out information with the bill as well. So people who get their bill, I know you put together a, a sheet, an information sheet that went out to everybody with their bill. Right. It's an important reminder, I think, for people when they get their bill to, to make sure they take a look at the information in mm -hmm. the bill stuffer. Mm -hmm. Um, we try to succinctly describe some of the things that are new for new customers, what they can expect and why they receive the bill, mm -hmm. and what they're looking at. So mm -hmm. that would be an important document for people to take a look at. Excellent. Well, thank you both again for, for being on today and for helping us try to demystify this a little bit. And, and thanks to folks at home for tuning in to the Marriage Report. As always, if you have questions or you have suggestions for, uh, for future episodes, feel free to contact me. You can do that by email at mayor at northamptonma.gov, or you can call my office at 413-587-1249. Thanks again for tuning in to the Mayor's Report, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>